Thank you. Appreciate that. Mr. Jaffe. Wow. Uh, to uh, to Ed's point, um, both Jared Lochner and uh, James Holmes were identified by the mental health system as needing treatment. And in both cases, HIPAA and FERPA kept their parents in the dark before the tragedy. So what he's talking about is really, pro this is also new to me, and I wanna thank the congressmen that are here, and Mr. Murphy, what you're, Congressman Murphy, what you're seeing is something different going on. We've had tons of mental health bills. This is the first one that focuses on the elephant in the room, which is how do we get people known to have serious mental illness, in particular, adults. There's been a lot of effort to children, veterans, but adults known to have serious mental illness who go untreated. And this is the first bill that does that. We agree with the majority report. We are not advocates for mental health. We are not advocates for improving the mental health of all Americans. What we are is advocates for the most seriously mentally ill. Not all mental illness is serious. 20%, 100% of adults can have their mental health improved, and that's where a lot of federal money goes. 20% of adults over 18 have a diagnosable mental illness. That's people in this room and your coworkers on Prozac or Zoloft who are doing quite well. But only 4% have serious mental illness, which includes the 1% with schizophrenia and the 2% with severe bipolar and some other individuals. My one message is we have to stop ignoring the most seriously ill. We can't go on pretending that they don't exist like the SAMHSA-funded groups want us to do. Until the 1960s, virtually all mental health expenditures were spent on the most seriously ill because the expenditures went to state psychiatric hospitals. But after that, um, at the request of the mental health industry, the funds are now spent on all others. As a result of this shift from focusing on the seriously mentally ill to trying to improve the mental health of all others, 164,000 are homeless and 300,000 incarcerated. And a disproportionate number of them are people of color who cannot get treatment. Parents, I get calls from people like that all the time. They beg and plead for treatment for their adult children known to have serious mental illness and the mental health system turns them away. We know how to, they fund everything else. We do know how to treat the most seriously mentally ill to see that they gain, uh, to see that they get treatment. We have to prioritize spending. This is one of those issues where it's not, it may not be that we're not spending enough. We spend $130 billion, an amount that's supposed to go up to $204 billion. What we have to do is start sending the seriously ill to the head of the line. We have to replace mission creep with mission control. If we do that, we can start to address the problems we see. Ed's talked about HIPAA. I won't uh, go into that. Uh, there are some, I hate to say it, it's an unpleasant truth. There are some seriously mentally ill people who need to be in hospitals. We do not have enough hospitals for them. We need more hospital beds. This bill doesn't ignore that. It recognizes it and starts to fix it. We have to get, if we can only do one thing, I want to cut spending. Stop SAMHSA from funding anti-treatment advocacy and stop PAMI from empowering that. And you can see a lot of information on our website how they do that. But SAMHSA is the biggest problem we have. We have to recognize that some people are so sick they don't know they're sick. When you see somebody going down the street, screaming at voices only they can hear, yelling that they're the Messiah, it is not because they think they're the Messiah. They know they're the Messiah. The illness tells them they are the Messiah. And as the Messiah, they are never going to volunteer for treatment. And we have to recognize this reality. 
most importantly, we have to expand the use of assisted outpatient treatment for a very small group of the most seriously ill. Earlier, I talked about four or five percent being seriously mentally ill. There is a small subset of that group who don't recognize their ability to get their need for treatment, who already have multiple arrests, multiple incarcerations, multiple uh, incarcerations, multiple instances of homelessness, all associated with going off voluntary treatment that was made available to them. What AOT does is it says for this tiny group of people, after full due process and including a lawyer, it allows judges to order them into six months of mandated and monitored treatment in the community. In the community. It's been proven to reduce violence, 60, serious violence, 66%. Reduce homelessness, arrest, hospitalization, incarceration, 74% each. Peer support and trauma-informed care do not do that. Consistent with the spirit of Olmsted, AOT prevents us from needing expensive, inhumane, inpatient commitment, incarceration, or hospitalization. It allows people to live in the community. It's perhaps the most humane thing we can do. It's an off-ramp before jail. It's like putting a fence at the edge of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. The committee heard from police chiefs, sheriffs, judges, homeless advocates, parents, and children of the seriously mentally ill in support of AOT. The only opposition comes from the SAMHSA-funded mental health industry. That is the only opposition. And they are basing their opposition based on stuff that is not fact. AOT does not take away everyone's rights. The courts have used, ruled it's an appropriate way to protect the individual who can't help themselves and public safety. It does not, force does not drive people for care. 80% of those enrolled in AOT said it helped them get well and stay well. It doesn't cause stigma. Research shows that those who received AOT by being integrated in the community perceive less stigma than all others. Police Chief Biasati said it best when he told the committee, we have two mental health systems today serving two mutually exclusive populations. Community programs serve those who voluntarily accept and seek treatment. Those who refuse or are too sick to seek treatment voluntarily become a law enforcement responsibilities. Mental health officials, especially SAMHSA, seem unwilling to recognize or take responsibility for the second, more symptomatic group. Ignoring them puts patients, public, and the police at risk. So I thank Representative Murphy. I thank the congressman who supported it, and I especially support my fellow Democrats. I am about as liberal as you can get. But for too long, we Democrats have failed to recognize unpleasant truths, like not everyone recovers. Sometimes hospitals are needed. And left untreated, there is a small group of the most seriously ill who do become violent. So what I say is we have to pass H.R. 3717. We have to move from a system that requires tragedy to one that prevents it. And on our website and attached to my statement, you can find more information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Wilner. Thank you, Chairman Murphy. And um, Mr. Kelly, and DJ, really uh, appreciate hearing from you, learning from you, and I um, want to thank the members for coming, and, and certainly those of you who are here today. Appreciate your uh, taking the time, taking it seriously. There comes a time when denial is no longer possible, and we've reached that time. Many of us, and perhaps most of us, are here 